Hello everybody, I'm uh, Bob Davis, I'm Chair of the Road Danger Reduction Forum. Um, I posted a uh, post here uh, at the beginning of the crisis, been updating on rdrf.org.uk uh, most weeks, I don't know if uh, I'll put one online, I might a bit later. Um, the last one I did, uh, this sh should be a new golden age for cycling, was last week's update. Um, glad to see it, but after I requested on Twitter for people to read it, I got an extra uh, 800 people or so to come and visit. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, and yeah, before I start, when it comes to questions, uh, just a second, uh, uh, Ruth. Uh, Ruth Mayorkas's thing to say who you are and which organization you're from. Okay, so this is basically the update of everything that's happened over the last week or so. So if you want to say, oh yeah, but something's happened in Leeds, I would have covered that last week. Not to say that I've got everything, but here's my stab at it. Okay, so first slide. Right, so the new golden age for cycling, which the Prime Minister announced uh, on the 6th of May, how's it shaping up? Well, first couple of, uh, of, of uh, things to say in the press. Apparently Grant Shapps has been thinking about uh, giving so-called free parking or additional subsidy to parking. Um, Point two, there's a article in the Times which says that Johnson has suggested that he wants to be interventionist on the obesity issue, um, apparently because he weighs 70 and a half stone now. But uh, anyway, so there may be some active travel stuff in there. Interesting little article on the Cycling UK website. Uh, now, this Unfortunately, this was taken by Adam Kaufman of uh, the All Party Parliamentary uh, Cycling and Walking Group. Um, Ruth Cadbury, a couple of days ago, or I uh, know it was yesterday, asked uh, the DFT, were, when are they gonna publish the revised design guidance and how the funding required for walking and cycling is going to be accessed. And she was told, in due course. So the main news, I think, from this last week is that we still don't know where boroughs uh, in London and councils outside London are going to get their money from, how they're going to get it, and when the revised design guidance is actually going to be made available for them. That may happen, you know, may be happening as we speak, may happen tomorrow, we don't know. But there's an issue, there's an issue about London not having had specific funding given and how the other councils, highway authorities throughout the UK are going to get theirs. Will they have to have LSWIPs already uh, published or not? Okay, another a letter from Mr. Heaton Harris uh, yesterday again. Uh, as Adam Kaufman said, the good news is the DFT is considering offering more cycle training for secondary school kids and key workers. That's very important, something I've been banging on about. No VAT cut on bikes and no grant for buying e bikes. That's when there is support for uh, electric cars. Um, now, two things I strongly suggest you read by Phil Goodwin. Uh, something in the current issue of Local Transport Today on cost-benefit cost analysis, strongly suggest you read that. Um, he also did a tweet saying, uh, talking about the whole interaction between public transport, walking and cycling, and he's saying there's a, a need to cut car traffic ramming home that point. There hasn't been anything about that uh, nationally, not that I've seen, you know, to, to, to what measures are actually going to be taken to reduce car traffic. Okay, uh, 
Next slide. So, so let's look at some what's been happening in some of the cities in the UK. Uh, there's Birmingham has come up with the emergency transport plan. Link there to it. Emergency transport plan is discussed in an article by Carlton Reed here. In Manchester, the Deansgate uh, partial road closure filtered permeability has gone in. Um, it's supposed to be not that ambitious and there have been some queries about uh, uh, cargo bikes getting through in there and access for people with disabilities. Um, also been some concern about exactly how much Manchester is stonking along, but anyway. Uh, Newcastle also come up with some plans. Cardiff, we can see some stuff. Liverpool, two million pounds given green light for pop-up cycle lanes. Edinburgh, what's happening in Edinburgh? Well, you know, people complaining about it. People complaining about Lancaster again. Uh, uh, my uh, colleague Adrian Davis once talked about the pedestrianised area in central Lancaster as being exactly how not to do pedestrianisation. Um, Bristol, yeah, been some disappointments from the mayor there. There's a campaign to get a section of dual carriageway repurposed. Let's see what happens there. Uh, okay, now general campaigns, there is a push uh, as uh, Chris Kenyon don't know if he's here tonight. Chris Kenyon, Labour Cycles, um, is behind us to get key workers to be able to have uh, safer infrastructure to walk and cycle to hospital. And the news is that three of the biggest NHS trusts in London are on board with this as of the 18th of May. That's yesterday. Uh, Extinction Rebellion were out doing stuff over the weekend. That was talked about last week. And here's an example of um, a protest which isn't actually specifically about this, but is um, a uh, climate change extinction rebellion protest. And, you know, this is the way for protests to happen at the moment. Uh, this, I think, is uh, the shoes of children who are going to be affected by climate change in Trafalgar Square. And it's, uh, you know, uh, a socially distanced protest. Um, Okay, now I'm going to spend a bit of time on London, uh, and this I think does have certain kinds of relevance to everybody. Uh, this is the quote the mayor came up with on the 15th We want to make transport in London safe and keep London globally competitive, then we have no choice but to rapidly repurpose London Street for people. Um, a link there, and there is a lot to read. I mean, a lot of it is specifically for um, officers and uh, local activists in London, but you know, it's probably a good idea for all of you to have a look at it, and there's a lot there. So let's have a look at what is happening in London. Uh, now, this is a graphic, and you, know, you will see there's a lot about having this uh, very large car-free area in the center of London. And uh, lots of people like the Road Haulage Association, the cabbies have got very excited about this. It's all terrible, the world's going to end. Um, one of the things I've been saying is don't get carried away by it because this area, um, you know, this, these roads will be bus, white, walk, cycle only. Um, this area is actually in there. If you can look at the little bit of graphic on the in the left-hand corner, it's actually only covering this part of London. And it rather reminds me of what happened when the congestion charge came in, where um, we were told, oh, you know, this is going to be the way forward. And actually, the congestion charge area is only a small part of in London. So don't get carried away. Um, right, so what's gone in already is uh, Park Lane um, has had a semi-segregated or segregated cycle track put in. This has been, these wands have been beefed up a bit since this photo was taken. Um, very important because one of the first pieces of cycle infrastructure in Britain was in the mid 80s on the board, Broadwalk in 
uh, Hyde Park, uh, which has now become rather unpleasant for cyclists with rumble strips. And uh, so really this is sort of letting those of us who used to cycle up Park Lane in the 70s and 80s, it's a restore, restoration of the status quo ante, except a bit nicer. However, as Mark Treasure pointed out this morning, how far up does it go? So there's a question mark over that, you know, is this just a bit of flagship waving or sorry, flagship, whatever the uh, word is. Okay, here's another bit of uh, temporary stuff, a footway extension in Halston Town Centre in Brent. That's gone in. Now here's some stuff in Greenwich. There's been a blog post written about it here. And this looks quite impressive. Uh, you know, look at this top. There's a big chunk of a, a footway extension here and there. A um, lot of pedestrian guard railing has been taken out and you've got a 20 mile an hour limit put in. I don't know what kind of orders were brought in or how this was done, but there it is. So that's good. But down there, you can see there's a nice bit of uh, temporary barrier, but cars have been parked there. So which is kind of against the spirit of it. And of course here, you've got another nice bit of barriers and someone's managed to drive behind them. So, you know, let's look at what, can go wrong as well as what can go right. Um, now, here's something which is interesting. Uh, you will know that Kensington Ch Chelsea has been generally opposed to anything in favour of uh, segregated cycle lanes. Um, but now we see this uh, a couple of days ago, uh, says uh, going to make the whole borough 20 mile an hour, widen pavements, speed up the construction of planned cycleways, more school traffic uh, streets, upgrading mandatory cycle lanes to light segregation, more cycle parking, closing a road to traffic, etc. Introducing a low traffic neighborhood. You know, not setting the world on fire, but it looks like they're kind of thinking of doing stuff. Now, why are they doing that? And uh, I think, and I'll mention this a bit later, I think it's because they've been told they have to, otherwise, A, you're not going to get money, which isn't a big thing for Kensington and Chelsea and the other anti-cycling borough in London, or big anti-cycling borough in London, uh, namely City of Westminster, uh, because they've got plenty of money in reserves. It's because they are worried about the threat that the road concerned will be taken away from them and that the uh, Transport for London or even the Department for Transport will put stuff in if they don't. That's the possibility. You know, we don't know, maybe. Uh, I welcome any views in the discussion. Uh, similarly, uh, Wandsworth have come up with uh, measures to improve safety and support social distancing. There's the link. Um, I refer to that because take a look at it and it's all kind of pretty lukewarm, you know, compared to Hackney or Camden or other places. And also uh, because this was their graphic that's on the, the link. And Chris Kenyon, uh, who I mentioned before, made some comments about it, which I think are relevant, saying, please comms people, please. Say there are people walking about, it's about healthy streets or low traffic neighborhoods. It's not just bikes. And for goodness sake, drop the grass. You know, it's not people cycling on grass. It's, not a, it's about streets, not parks. Plus, you know, put panniers and baskets on the bikes have at least 50% of riders without helmets. That's something uh, Lambeth uh, did with regard to their publicity about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and let's have some Dutch style bikes. You can see, you know, look at these bikes here. You know, they've got drop handlebars up in the air. And, and if you're saying, oh, come on, you know, it's just a diagram. Believe me, the people who do comms graphics have a lot of thinking behind them. Okay still on London and we come back to London Borough of Lambeth and here's some tweets from uh, Claire Holland who's the lead councillor in Lambeth 
Uh, remember, they've done a borough-wide order. They came out, they were the first uh, London borough to come up with a, a borough strategy. And she's now saying, if I can whip through this, uh, uh, we've uh, repurposed the program for the next six months with 1.8 million pounds from the highways budget, which is a sort of reasonable amount of money. And they're intended to do four low traffic neighborhoods, three healthy routes, including protected cycle lanes, three access only roads, which is, as I take it as a sort of form of filtered permeability, uh, six more locations for pavement widening. However, our plan goes much further. If we're able to access emergency funding, aha, big if, we are planning to implement local tra uh, low traffic neighborhoods across large swathes of Lambeth and build eight temporary cycle tracks alongside a raft of, we like rafts of, school streets, pavement widening and cycle training programs. Um, I just noted that the population of Lambeth is 330,000. So, you know, those of us living in say, uh, somewhere like Swansea has got about a quarter of a million. So, you know, get that gives you an idea of the kind of population it's got. Um, okay, so Camden have also got, go to that link, they've got a um, program where members of the public can write in and say, you know, please do something at this location. Uh, Fitzrovia, uh, ha, which is a neighborhood partly in West, Westminster and partly in Camden, has put forward plans to make Fitzrovia a low traffic neighborhood. Okay, Hackney, you will have seen as from yesterday and today, pictures of this road, Queensbridge Road, where cycle tracks have gone in. Uh, they were planned and already started before this. But what I noticed is that you can see there and here, it's being filtered off as well. So in fact, there are kids and people playing out here. Uh, because it's become uh, uh, an emer you know, with the emergency legislation, temporary, uh, whatever it is, they've got uh, filters put in. Now, a um, lot of campaigning going on. Merton, take a look at this PDF. Merton has, um, uh, along with uh, my colleague Lucy Taussig, uh, has um, uh, sent in a thing to the council saying, please do stuff. Uh, one of the replies they got back was about how they're intending to, or thinking of doing filters, but they need to have consultation. So, you know, do other boroughs have to have consultation processes in place for, uh, for filters? I don't think so. Um, so Merton is saying they do, but do they? Okay, now uh, come back to this question of why boroughs are doing what they're doing or saying what they're saying. This is an article by Simon Monk where he says, it is clear that any funding now coming from the mayor and TFL will be likely to go to those boroughs getting on with this. He's referring to the street space for London approach. And it is being implied that those council who do, who do nothing may face the prospect of these approaches being delivered by the DFT or TFL, despite their objections. So I think that's the story. And I think what's happening is that some boroughs, uh, we talked about Warnsworth and Kenton and Chelsea, are kind of going through the motions for that reason. Okay, so uh, that's kind of infrastructural stuff. Um, couple of uh, what I have to go on to now is there's a lot of stuff come bigotry and prejudice I say because that's what it is the journos you know uh, what are you going to do to stop cyclists breaking the law why can't they not break the law like motorists do um, so uh, cabbies doing their stuff the LTDA uh, the Road Haulage Association and it's actually good to see those of you on Twitter uh, really weighing in and actually in with very politely and in good humor um, confronting uh, the sort of nonsense they're coming out with. Some of it isn't, isn't sort of naked prejudice. It's just sort of general misconceptions about active travel 
you know, like you know, the Women's Equality Party coming up saying, well, you know, you can't do it, it's bad for, bad for old people. I also noticed um, uh, some tweets from uh, Steve Norris. Now, he's interesting because, uh, you know, apart from his various posts as uh, road safety minister and various consultancies, uh, you know, being the uh, chief, uh, chief head honcho of the Road Haulage Association and uh, top of the Motorcycle Industry Association, Association. He was a, a, a heading Cycling England in the noughties. And it was uh, interesting to see that when he, that he objected to the uh, cycle lanes going in and uh, making comments, uh, you know, the classic straw man comment, the idea that we can all walk or cycle is absurd. And of course, nobody has been saying this. And you will all know that whenever any plans for sports cycling come up, oh, well, you know, not everybody can do it and so on. And also he had a tweet saying, you know, what about people uh, who want to travel more than three miles who are not fit and who are not young? I mean, please. Uh, you know, this is from the guy who headed up Cycling England. Um, that particular tweet does seem to have disappeared. So uh, nice to see that he did withdraw it. But there is an issue about you know, how we deal with this bigotry and prejudice, not just because it's dangerous in on-road situations, but in order to get the kind of infrastructure and changes that we need. So um, what was interesting this week is this guy, Mo Salah, who I am reliably informed is a professional association footballer, uh, and who has 1.2 million followers on Twitter, uh, was seen on his bicycle. And uh, this was very nice. He's not white. He's smiling. He's wearing normal clothes. He's not wearing a helmet. So, of course, you know, big pile in about helmets. Um, some of the uh, cycle racing mobs have pointed out that actually his, his, his brake levers are in the wrong place. His handlebars haven't been, uh, need to be, swung forward a bit uh, but uh, anyway so you know just making the point this is a nice image also you know the big bike revival which has got an important road, role to play you know nice images nice initiatives but you know we need to have something more forceful more messaging about how cyclists have every right to be out there you don't have a special right to be out there because you're driving uh, and you know all the bicycle bingo stuff you know road tax blah 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 so uh, that's my little thing for today. I did promise to do a uh, uh, thing on confronting bicycle bingo, and I will try and do it at some stage. Uh, maybe I can have a slot next week or another time. I don't know. I'll try and do a web post when I can. But anyway, that's the news for, to, for this last week. Um, main thing being we're still kind of a bit up in the air about where funding is going to come from exactly how it's going to be accessed when the design guidelines are going to be published how is london going to get its money some people are doing stuff lots of stuff has been going on no doubt i've missed a lot of stuff you can always dm me or stick it up on twitter but um there's also some not particularly brilliant stuff happening. So that is it. I sort of felt, felt there was a need to write some design principles for the infrastructure that's going in. So I published an opinion piece and I sort of restructured that and expanded it and condensed it. Um, and now it's seven design principles uh, for pop up higher infrastructure. Um, I'm an independent consultant and I uh, sort of design places that Sort of change driver behavior and that's the aim um, to enable people to relax and enjoy streets and um, places that people enjoy they'll come back to and um, where they spend time they'll spend money so sort of projects that, that sort of do that where we, we change the character to change driver behavior are things like the castle square in Carnarvon, which is a sort of uh, created sort of uh, historic town square um, and that used to be very traffic dominated so they completely transform the character, 
Um, and now all these events can take place in the space um, and um, people can sit and have coffee in the space. Um, Operation Street Chester is another one where we change driver behaviours. We had a street with very narrow pavement. Um, people were very much tucked to the side of the street and created a flush surface. It's been praised by the local um, disability groups, including the visually impaired people, and it's completely changed the character of the street. And drivers, bus drivers, who drive up to five, spend mile an hour down this street now. Um, created the town square in Kidderminster outside the town hall, which just used to be a, um, a junction, really. Um, and that, again, takes all the traffic. So it's all about changing. This is Accrington. Um, Town Square, which, which used to just be a street. So using the public realm and the urban environment to affect how people drive and therefore affect how people could pedestrian people can use the space. Normally at this point I, I sort of show some videos um, of, of the schemes to really sort of but they, they're, they're the only way to really show how drivers behave and the change in driver behaviour. But you can't, well. I'm not going to risk that over Zoom anyway, so um, I'll, I'll put this link um, in the presentation which you can get to, or, or you can contact me and get the link off the video. So uh, the seven design principles um, here, and I'll go through them in turn. Um, so design principle one, uh, design for everyone. Uh, the equality duty um, applies to temporary infrastructure. But also, obviously, we're designing for cyclists and pedestrians as well, um, particularly those most at risk. Um, but also other forms of sort of innovative micro mobility, um, including e-bikes, cargo bikes, because more of this is going to happen, um, hopefully, um, as part of whatever's going to happen over the next year. So we need we need schemes that will accommodate everybody. Uh, design principle two uh, is declutter, um, and particularly prioritise guardrail removal. Um, it's, it's sort of linear form is the most obstructive social distancing and it impedes footway widening. Um, so this is, this is a big one compared to other street furniture removal, yes, but concentrate on guardrail removal. And TfL have demonstrated the 56% reduction in KSI uh, when guardrails are removed from crossings and junctions. So, so it's a win-win. Design principle three, it's, it's all about context as well as movement. And I'm, I think uh, um, Rob, Robert mentioned Lancaster before. Um, this is Lancaster, I live in Lancaster. Um, this is um, the main gyratory. Um, it's two, two lanes, one way, and I'm just using this as an example. So yeah, two lanes, one way. There's a, a very poor cycle route that all the students get knocked, on, knocked down on. Um, there's a, a cafe and a bakery on the street. Um, and um, it's a key pedestrian route between the bus and the rail stations. Also, if you're going to the hospital at all, you, you would have to take this route from the rail station. So the, the top, top section is sort of existing, two-way traffic, very narrow and crowded. And um, the bottom section is what, what it could be. And, um, if, you, if you drop to one, one traffic lane, you had a segregated cycle lane, you remove the guardrail, widen the footway, you can have a path up there. Um, outside the cafe and the bright bakery, um, get some seating in there for people as well. So look at all these other uses of the, the other functions, the non-movement functions, as well as the movement functions. This one is I'm still on design principle three here, so it's in context. So here, this is Ambleside, and this is where you walk from the car park to, to the town centre. There's not enough space for segregation here. I mean, it's, it's a tiny footway with masses of people who, Going along it. You have two way moving, two way slow moving traffic. So consider a pedestrian priority design techniques here. Um, get people walking in the carriageway, use street furniture to, to tell drivers what's going to happen and to expect people in the carriageway. Aim in the lower speed spur, which is a 10 mile an hour um, area. Design principle four it is healthy streets. And these principles apply more than ever. I won't, won't go through them all, but um, yeah, they're, they're more important than ever now. Uh, design principle five is social, um, economic, and environmental functions, so all the non movement functions. Um, so, for instance, um, older people might be avoiding public transport um, 
they then have to walk longer distances, queue repeatedly um, for, the, for the different shops, and so they're going to need to sit down. So um, regular seating makes journeys possible for these people, um, and it enables them to remain independent as well. Um, so as well as seating, there's obviously also the cafe seating, outdoor retail, it's part of the style of design. David, really compact. David, can it just be really annoying? Uh, are you, are you yeah. like miles away from your microphone or anything? Just to, I can come closer if that helps. Well, that's, that helps a bit more. I know you look like you're in a spectacularly awkward position now, but at least we can hear you. You're getting a little bit underwater there. Thanks, okay, mate. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so um, the, the parklet style of um, CT uh, is a really compact way to get things into your um, street. So design principle five is um, communicating to drivers how they want to behave. And I suppose this is where I really started the guidance when I first sort of seen what was going in and, and what worried me. Um, if you sort of applied the guardrail principle, um, removal principle to this, um, it, it felt like we were putting barriers up between people and the spaces and that could in increase the uh, number of accidents or number of collisions. So um, if, you, if you use racetrack design language, you get speeding. Um, so we've already had speeding um, when the streets are quieter. Um, people need to be both visually and physically present in the street to calm traffic. Um, but also, I think this sort of this, it's a bit of a design language of fear and we're all a bit mentally fragile at the moment and people are concerned about going out and, and, and this will make them more concerned and that will discourage people visiting high streets. Um, and design principle seven, the last one, um, got to be practical, robust and flexible elements. Um, they have to be appropriate to, to the location. We have to start to think about how long they're going to be in place. Um, we have to have management and maintenance regimes for them. And um, we also have to be able to respond to change because we're not quite sure what the conditions are going to be uh, going forward and what the requirements are going to be. We might put things in that, that don't work out that, that um, cause problems and we need to be able to change them. So that's the seven principles. Um, I'm, I'm the Landscape Institute Technical Committee and um, the Landscape Institute have um, turned them into some draft guidance um, and we'd like your comments on that please. So I've got an email address there by 31st of May and the, the Landscape Institute document is on that link. Um, and then I, I've started to just sort of develop the thinking um, to sort of something more approaching design guidance. And I sort of set out um, a blog uh, sort of for discussion very much um, based on two tables, just really on the per, uh, pedestrian permeability element of these sort of uh, barriers. And so the two tables, one is um, about the treatments between uh, pedestrians and vehicles when widening footways and I've shown different treatments for different speed limits just as a, a way of dividing them up and the green column there is sort of preferred treatments including um, the sort of pedestrian permeability of, of the treatment between you and the vehicle and then the grey is a sort of more acceptable in this emergency response type of treatment. Um, so I've just sort of throwing these together really. So very much, they're very much for discussion, not, not at all clinging to any of these um, particular treatments. So please, please say whatever you think about them. And then I've done this, the second table is for treatments between cyclists and vehicles when you're introducing cycleway in very similar concept. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me, Brian. Um, just, just like to hear people's comments. Just to introduce myself, for those that um, I haven't maybe connected with or spoken with before, um, my name's Thomas um, Knights and I represent Strava Metro, um, which is the, the, I suppose, the data and the uh, insights and analytics um, arm of Strava. Um, um, I'm based um, actually in, in uh, London, down in Rains Park, um, but the, uh, the Strava kind of uh, HQ for the UK is in Bristol um, as well. Um, for those of you perhaps that aren't familiar with Strava, 
um, on the um, on the uh, on the call today. Or I just wanted to kind of give a very quick um, kind of thirty second overview of what we do um, as a wider kind of business. Um, but then certainly from a metro point of view, um, Brian and I were talking the other day about unleashing the potential um, of the metro data set. Um, a in a kind of um, post pandemic world, but also looking back at uh, how infrastructure has impacted route choices um, all the way back to say 2017 and lessons that we can learn from that um, when used alongside other data um, that perhaps um, city departments, city transport planners and uh, departments of transport may have access to um, as well. So for those that don't necessarily um, are familiar with Strava, um, we are the, I suppose, an aggregator of, um, of activity data. Um, so our members um, and our subscribers will upload GPS activities um, via smartphone, maybe their watch, um, fitness device. Uh, we've got roughly, kind of, I think, 30 or 14 different activity types um, on the platform. Um, but the Metro data set specifically focuses on active travel, um, which can be aligned onto a base map. Um, in this case, it's OpenStreetMap um, is the, map, the mapping tool that we use. Um, but essentially, we look at bicycle rides um, that have been logged on Strava um, and then also um, pedestrian activity. So a run, a walk or a cycle. Oh, sorry, a run, a walk or a hike um, on there. Um, for that, again, for those that aren't necessarily familiar with the um, Strava platform, you can then also tag your activity as a commute um, or a leisure trip um, as well. So we do have a variety of, uh, of activity on there um, as well. Um, I won't necessarily do a, a kind of death by kind of PowerPoint um, <laughs> this evening, but I'm certainly happy to share these slides with everyone after the call through Brian um, as well. Um, but we're, we're confident with, with obviously the, the kind of the user base that we have and, and certainly the, uh, the kind of um, involvement of, um, of, of participants on Strava, um, that we've got a really, really useful um, and, and incredibly large active transportation data set. So to date, there's something like 55 million members um, globally um, seven and a half million of which are, are based in the UK. So roughly what 11% I think of the, the UK population is now downloaded Strava um, at some point um, as well. So again, in incredible potential if we can start to use this crowdsource data um, involved in uh, transportation planning. Um, the Metro mission um, is, is, uh, is, like I say, we're aligned to Strava, but essentially we want to give access to as many communities as possible um, to use this uh, data set um, in making efficient, accessible, uh, and of course, safer infrastructure um, as well. There may be some people familiar on the call with, with some of the use cases um, of the Strava Metro data, um, but certainly happy to kind of share um, all of this um, on this as well, on the call as well. Um, the, um, the, the examples that we've got, um, again, have been over the last kind of five or six years. We've partnered with lots of different um, uh, transportation uh, bodies as well. So happy to share that um, with you as well. Um, I just wanted to, in the interest of time, probably just go straight to, to kind of the, uh, the update that I was sharing with Brian is that we are changing the way that we deliver our data um, now, rather than being in heavy GT GIS um, uh, kind of exported uh, folder, um, which is delivered on a monthly or a quarterly basis, um, we're now able to deliver this data um, via a web dashboard um, as well. So tonight I just wanted to share the example of uh, Bristol, uh, the Strava's home office um, here in the UK, uh, and just give you an idea of the potential of using this um, across as many local authorities and, and obviously uh, different bodies that, that would be involved in active travel planning uh, across the country. Um, I should note, of course, uh, that Strava is not going to capture every single trip um, that, uh, that's being made on the roads, or, but certainly we can start to assign um, a counter kind of correlation uh, between Strava activity uh, and any kind of other bicycle counter data that's out there. Um, we then can also split between um, pedestrian, like I said, and, um, and obviously bicycle data um, as well. Um, on the very high level kind of overview, we're able then to kind of break down between leisure and commute. As I mentioned earlier, commuting was either self-defined or what Strava defines as a route A to route B um, journey between say one and 12 kilometers. Um, so cities and planners can start to kind of understand what ridership maybe looks like um, and different patterns have changed um, over time um, as well. Um, just in terms of the, the geospatial data then, um, that's now delivered via the mapping tool. So we have the heat map, which many of you may be familiar with, um, it's a, essentially a version of the global heat map, which I'm showing you now on the screen. Uh, this is publicly available, um, but the Strava Metro platform um, enables, sorry, the Strava Metro platform has basically just put this onto uh, a, a geospatial 
data um, set which allows you to export and do some analysis. So for example, we can explore popular routes based on two years of Strava activity. Again, using the example of Bristol, you can see an origin um, and then a destination point um, and see maybe infrastructure has an impact on, the, on route choice or perhaps um, any kind of physical barriers. Um, and again, when you use this alongside existing counter data, it's, it's incredibly powerful um, as well. Um, from a really high level point of view, um, we've got um, the analysis of corridors, again, based on Strava activity. We can start to change that by what you would probably call a commutable distance. So between say naught and say um, uh, 11 miles. And these, this will show the timing um, of there as well. Um, and then very briefly, before I kind of move on to, to kind of questions, um, the data is now delivered through the streets tab, um, which then allows you to um, analyze at a street level um, all of the uh, different data points um, that Strava uh, has aggregated and of course anonymized um, from trips um, that have taken place. So if I was doing some analysis um, at a junction, um, so for example um, here, I could then see the number of trips on Gloucester Road in March 2020 um, and then see the breakdown um, of maybe commuting leisure trips, uh, the number of people, um, the average speed for example, um, and then of course the demographic data. So I'll, um, I'll wrap it up there really quick because I'm sure um, Brian, Brian has some comments or, or maybe questions on there. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that this is you know, available for people to apply to, to kind of gain access to this. Um, if you've got an infrastructure project or you're doing some analysis, then please do get in touch and, and we'd be happy to, to kind of share access to this for your, uh, for your area of interest. Thanks a lot for that, Thomas. I mean, yeah, my mouth was watering and not just because I wanted some more beer, but just at the, uh, the transport planning potential of getting my hands on that one. So, uh, yeah, you're becoming my best friend at the moment. Um, <laughs> so any, has anybody got any uh, questions for Thomas? Uh, yes, please. Surely. Please, yep. Go for it, Simon. Thomas, whenever I've uh, used, pointed people at Strava heat map data, the question comes back about the profile of the people using it. Yeah. Uh, I know a fair few people who, who aren't sports cyclists who seem to uh, track their commutes, but do you have any real data about how representative it is? Yeah, really, really good question. We've, um, we, we've done a lot of work um, with, with lots of partners just to kind of um, understand that kind of um, representation of the overall population. So I think as with any mobility data source, um, Metro isn't going to cover the entire population. Um, but since we've launched um, the, the kind of Metro platform in its, uh, in its new kind of format, um, we've worked with lots of different partners and research institutions on the way that you can use an adjustment. Perhaps that enables a, a kind of more powerful analysis of the overall population um, as well. So I'm happy to share about 24 hours ago, the, um, if I share my um, screen again, I don't know if I'm able to, um, the urban big data center actually uh, just published a, uh, a, a kind of paper just on predicting cycling volumes using crowdsourcing um, data. Um, and it really did reference how you can start to, uh, to kind of look at that Strava bias um, as well. And obviously kind of use that in your modeling, um, but definitely not going to capture every trip to Sainsbury's or, or, or Tesco's, et cetera. But um, certainly we, with the penetration that we've got now, I think of users, we're starting to see more and more what, what we would call um, or perhaps even um, as far as to say materials on there. Thomas, can you clarify our campaigning groups or advocacy groups able to access the data? Yeah, wait, so the short answer is absolutely. Um, what we want to do with this, uh, with this data set is um, effectively give it to the, the organizations that can demonstrate the, the, the kind of biggest impact in, in terms of infrastructure accessibility. So um, rather than say, for example, um, so I live in a, a small area in Rains Park, rather than giving kind of access to the Rains Park Residents Association, I'd far rather that went to Merton County Council who are working in conjunction with um, on that side. So um, the, the, the wider the net, the, the better. Um, you know, we, we're in conversations with, with obviously national governments as well as uh, local governments. Um, and the idea behind them um, is, is that you don't have to be a GIS um, uh, a kind of trained analysis. I, I should have done a caveat at the start that I'm, I'm a, an arched uh, kind of uh, background myself and I'm not a kind of geospatially trained, but um, I have an interest in mapping. Um, so, um, you know, anyone can use this and it's designed for that use. Exactly. 
Tom, yeah. you're, you're dodging my question. So, sorry, the, the question was really quick. If we've got a campaign group that is like at a borough level or a city level, yeah. um, I, I appreciate that there's an application process, but in principle, if that is a bona fide group that you recognize and can see they're real, are you a, like, do you generally give access and do you generally charge for that? Um, so yes to um, giving access. And then um, on, in terms of the, the, the licensing model, we are currently undergoing a review of that at the moment. So probably more to follow um, on that. But um, the answer is yes, we would give access to, uh, to advocacy groups. Yeah, so uh, the picture's looking rosy there. And, and, and for me, what's really exciting statistically is the 11% sample size of the population. It's pretty good for making uh, lots of uh, inferences. Has anybody got any uh, other questions? Shall we save some for the end? Uh, one more on the Strava, which is how, um, in principle, how would you make the um, data um, accessible, Thomas, uh, via an API or uh, another web? Um, so uh, essentially, when you when you log into the, um, the the kind of metro dashboard, now it's web based. Um, you can select each edge or street which is aligned onto OpenStreetMap, and then export that data either into an Excel um, file or, or a .csv. We are working on. Um, the ability to do kind of a bulk export at the moment. So at the moment that you're slightly limited to, uh, to kind of one or two edges. There's no, there's no uh, limit to how many you can have. It's just how, how long you could go on clicking each edge. Yeah, so uh, on previous sessions, we talked about links and temporary arrangements in there, but the, uh, the thorny question of, uh, of what you do at junctions, particularly signal junctions, has come up with where uh, for years, if we designed space that segregated cyclists on the near side, uh, we'd really want that to end somewhere near a signal junction or find some way of protecting them because you don't really want to arrive at a signal junction in that near side position unless you are protected. You need to get out early, mix with the cars, think what's going on. If we're trying to like uh, promote key workers and people who maybe haven't cycled for a while um, onto cycling, we don't want them to feel safe in that position <laughs> unless we're going to actually protect them because they, they really need to have the, the wits about them. So, so really, I'm looking, uh, I'm going to just give some options, really, of what we can do, how can we can, uh, ha how we can quickly adjust uh, signal junctions and other junctions of that type. Um, we kind of covered side roads as well last week, so I won't cover that one in there. So here's a few options. So definitely, some of them are more cooked than others. I'm definitely uh, thinking, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. So one of the things that's gone on, particularly from a pedestrian side of things, is like a extending the time to cross, uh, reducing the delay in there. This is a uh, something that uh, Transport for Greater Manchester has been doing. Uh, TfL have actually been doing this for quite a while in there. Um, people have been saying, oh, I'm still waiting 60 seconds. But we've gone, how? Oh, but before, you were waiting two and a half minutes. This is good. And it's a, it's a real key thing. We don't want people, when they do get out and start walking, getting back to work in there. If they gather around in clusters waiting for those few cars to go through, that's a real problem. So uh, um, extending the time to cross, shortening the delay that people have to wait to get across there is a, is a key one. And in most like um, uh, transport control units, it's a kind of flick of the switch thing. It really just needs the will to do it. Uh, not all signal junctions are under that control, but quite a lot are. So we can do that right now. And I'm glad to say Transport for Greater Manchester did just that. Uh, there's, a, there's a really boring picture, but this is, a, again, a key one, really, like a double cycling. Uh, it can sometimes take, in a kind of, particularly if you're in London, 96 seconds to go through this sequence and all arms, the red, red, amber, green, amber, and back to red again. But you can double cycle it, so it takes 45 seconds. So, again, less people congregating, more time you can cross, less delay in there. Uh, good stuff that can have a most uh, signal junctions can flip to that operation as well. So um, definitely worth considering quite technical solutions at the moment, but they always are when it comes to signal junctions. What if you've got a big signalized roundabout or just a massive roundabout and you've uh, socially distanced in there? Always like this one. I think Phil Jones is on there. I kind of steal it from his slides. He always shows it. Um, just the difference between a kind of continental geometry and a kind of a UK geometry and a roundabout. This, this can be done with cones as far as I'm concerned in there. If you're heading on like a, if you, if you look down the bottom there where it says A to B, you can see that massive sweeping radii that you could like hold in a left lock, 45 miles an hour, zoom around. That's going to be a nightmare if any cyclists are arriving on that near side in some kind of protected space in there. 
So we could cone out and do a more continental geometry on some of our larger junctions in there. I think that's well worth looking at it, particularly some of our, our massive signal junctions as well. We might necessarily need the massive sweeping flares that we've got, even if it means the odd uh, flexible post gets like uh, run over by HGB. We definitely uh, would prefer that than a cyclist who's been encouraged to go up the near side by some physical distance in lane. So um, geometry is your friend, use it. Um, yes, um, additional crossings I think is really important. If you did have like a, a massive signal junction, let's say it's like um, a T junction and you've only got like a, a formal crossing on one, maybe two arms, you put one on the third arm and then the whole thing starts getting controlled. It might take some more time out of the junction for people to cross in there. And you might, in this case, this is a Newcastle one. It's a full scheme, but it shows that what can be done with putting a crossing on, on one arm there. So, and uh, like I say, lots of our junctions might have uh, green men crossings, but they'll only be on one arm. Maybe consider putting temporary crossings in on all the arms. And it's something I've talked about in previous weeks as well. The, the power of putting a, a temporary crossing in there could really break up that traffic flow and give people some different options for, for cycling or walking across junctions. So uh, definitely worth thinking about. Yeah, this... I could have spent the entire hour explaining this and I had a good session with Adrian Lord and, uh, and Phil Jones where I was trying to explain it, but I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to introduce a kind of concept really of, of what I was thinking about. I was trying to think in a kind of thought experiment of how I could adjust the signal control junction without changing any of the method of control, without changing any curbs, without changing any lights and just allow cyclists to, to get a kind of protected junction vibe across it. Uh, if you can see there, those little green bits are basically like uh, curb build outs, basically places for cyclists to, to wait. And I was thinking, well, if they waited there and we had a sign there, they could look at the far sided aspect for pedestrians, if they did have far sided, and maybe cross with pedestrians and kind of use that stage in there so we can informally do a protected junction in there. There's a few tricky bits about it legally, there's no doubt about it, but that concept of like uh, giving cyclists some separate space to wait and maybe go across parallel with the pedestrians uh, seems uh, worth thinking about. You also get a kind of protected uh, left turn in that case as well, albeit the rights are still a little bit roundabout like most of the uh, protected junctions we have in there. Again, a concept that I'm still thinking about, can we make it work? I've shown this to some signal colleagues and they go, oh my God, that's complicated, who'll get it? But I think the actual concept of a separated area that you can wait in so you can feel safe within the mouth of the junction. For me, that's the essence of a protected junction. This gives it, and so I think uh, with a little bit of a more clever thought, we might be able to do something with that concept. That's a kind of big one for you. Uh, bringing in like uh, low-level cycle signals, uh, I've shown a cycle gate here. You can look at that kind of operation. Again, can be done with uh, temporary headers, uh, wheeling the equipment, get stuff to work in there. Also, like low level cycle signals might be able to give advances. We can adjust like uh, greens and reds and, and operate different cycle stages um, with low level cycles now. And so, uh, low level cycle signals, I will say. So, these options are all on the table. Again, it needs a little bit more thought. And um, when it comes to links at the moment, yeah, it's just about grabbing that space. But the point I've been making about signal junctions, and we kind of have to look at them all separately. The, they're all going to have different geometries, different movements, different strengths of like uh, turning vehicles, different mixes. We kind of really have to take them one by one. But that doesn't mean that we can't respond to it. And we can't adjust it quickly with some cones and some extra signal headers. So uh, uh, that's what I'm kind of trying to get up there. They're kind of getting a little bit more radical now. But is it that more radical? Is it more radical than the emergency we're facing in there? Got this from, uh, from America. You could, um, if it was a signal junction, take the signals out putting stop lines with the signs and have a kind of four-way stop that is like a quite a common treatment particularly if you had a larger junction you count it off so it's a kind of smaller junction this kind of everybody stop yield give way kind of approach in there might be something that we want to look at and i've got a few variations on that on this approach you could um you could do that and allow a kind of minor arm perhaps that's an arm that you're promoting cycling to go down it may be part of your strategic network or one of your lc whip ones in there dropping some stop lines in there so the cars know to stop and prioritizing cyclists across there could be more favorable to a kind of signal controlled option or perhaps you could do this just on a on the standard street i've got this from um 
and Portland, Oregon. Uh, don't know if you've ever cycled around there. I spent a nice summer doing it. It's kind of their bike boulevard approach where the they've got a grid system and they kind of put stop lines all the way along, but you get a through through route that they promote for cycling and it's uh it's really very pleasant. It might be something to think about. So I think there is a lot that we can do with stop lines. That's uh what I'm kind of hinting at there. Even even more radical radical, I'm kind of motoring through these because I want to have a bit of a discussion in there. But again, the that this was a signal controlled crossroads. Uh, I think Phil's on the line. He might explain a bit to us about it. But yeah, turn off the signals, paint some stuff in there, make it work like a roundabout, implied zebras, all this kind of stuff really works now. And, and there's a lot we can do with paint at junctions in there. If you were to turn uh, signal control off, and you were to paint stuff and make people behave like it's a giveaway roundabout and really uh, put some pedestrian priority uh, uh, measures in there as well. It could well be an approach that we should look at. It's the kind of... For me, we can do this in a kind of tactical urbanism way, and we shouldn't be frightened of using those techniques at signal control junctions, particularly when we turn those signal controls off. <laughs> the whole green you go, red you stop thing might necessarily help us through this crisis when we're trying to change stuff on the on the fly. Okay, a few more. Now, th this is where I'm like uh, start breaking uh, UK. Uh, traffic rules in there but it's it's basically a way of like a quickly adjusting a signal junction so you could have it just all flashing amber so it's effectively the lights are saying give way everybody and that you've got the stop lines there you've got the flashing amber everybody just proceed with care it makes people feel there's an emergency going on there is an emergency going on it might be something that we might want to consider about it so some of the more radical uh, traffic engineers might want to consider this kind of operation and i know a lot of these options the signal junctions are about removing them but it's very difficult our standard like signal operations in the uk are not particularly favorable for cyclists and they're certainly not favorable for cyclists who arrive in that near side position and that's the kind of big mental thing that we have to have to tackle i think yeah there's also some standard stuff i've shown a little bit of like uh, the kind of phase two super highways and the, the phase ones as well where we're taking out left slips again Left slip roads are a real nightmare if you're arriving in that near side position. You've got vehicles cutting across you. You want to go ahead and uh, cone it off, block it off, change the, the signal junction approaches there. The, these kind of tighten things. These All these junction designs that we've done over the years can be done with cones, and we can do a lot with geometry and banning certain movements. Uh, I think in, in particular the, the banning of uh, certain turns. If you ban a left, then the left hook issue is gone. <laughs> And that's like a, people can make their left turn somewhere else on the network. So fine, you can manage it a side road. It's okay. It's a side road that you put a side road zebra on. But if we can ban certain movements at signal junctions, we can have really quite decent cycling infrastructure going straight through with hardly any conflict, particularly if you're going straight ahead like the, the kind of super highway strategic cycle network kind of approach in there. So banning has always been our friend with cycling. Banned rights, banned lefts. The job's done, <laughs> we'll say. <laughs> Easier said than done. Okay, if any traffic engineers on the webinar are now starting to get a sweat. Um, there's obviously stuff we can do with warning people as well. Um, warning like drivers that cyclists are coming up to the junction, particularly where we've got new and experienced cyclists. Again, that near side position at junctions is always our big problem in there. If we can warn drivers that cyclists are coming up in that near side position in there, and the technology behind this stuff's got it's got pretty good now. They can pick it up with infrared, and there's TFL have got a lot of the uh, um, the new technology available in there. So for me, we can detect cyclists and we can warn drivers that the present to look out there so all that conspicuity raising stuff uh, the classic road safety approach i think now really works as well if we get our thinking caps on and one more um safety cameras that's got to work like uh, ampr stuff in there let's get those speeds anything we can do to reduce speeds anything uh, i'll put this up as well about positive messaging in there because it is one of those things in there and bob's raised it like every week and he's, he's absolutely right there is a certain amount of hostility still there's quite a lot of cars really enjoying going fast around there so it's about getting that message out that, hey this is someone who works for the nhs might be on that bike they're going off to save someone's life give them a bit of a break all these kind of messages and then tfgm do this really well i mean that's that's quite a silly one i've put up there 
but he have put some really quite nice positive messages out there. And I do like that idea that the don't drive solo in there. And it was like a, when Chewbacca was visiting TFGM. So they're all, all quite good. They can be changed straight from the office. We can get messages like this out there. I think for the drivers going along, who are the dangerous ones, as uh, Bob Davis will, will no doubt remind us, they are the dangerous ones. We've got to get the message to them to watch out for people in there. So we have those kind of options. So so really, that's my like uh, initial kind of 13 ideas um, and, and really, I'll just reiterate that different ones will be needed for different junctions, but we have to start getting our thinking caps on. T tying off the space is one thing. What do you do when you get to the massive signal junction? You've got all the conflicts in there. We have got techniques, and a lot of them can be done quickly. There's no point in scratching our heads and go, well, yeah, we need two years of modelling to adjust the signal junction. There is stuff that we can do now, and I'm hoping that we all go out and start doing stuff because the, the worst possible scenario would be we encourage lots more people to cycle and then there's a big spike in collisions as cars start coming back to some of these big junctions that we're going to get, particularly when we're doing the segregation on some of the busier roads. So um, that's that's kind of enough for me. Uh, cool. Bill? Hey, um, quick uh, one that occurred to me that we talked about about six, seven years ago was mixing zones. We, I remember trying to get a mixing zone in, in um, on the approach to a roundabout in Norwich and getting kicked back. But um, do you think that would might might be an option? Basically, the lane runs through, the cycle lane runs through, and the car lane is required to give way as it joins the mixed area. Yeah, you know, I was I was really umming and ahhing today about putting a mixing zone in there, and I, I remember well, you'll remember at the time as well. I did about twenty five different options when I was. Uh, drawing the designs for the London Cycling Design Standards. I thought, let's do a mixing zone, a Danish-style mixing zone. Um, that we kind of did ones um, early on in the superhighways where we kind of painted the whole near side lane blue and, and pretended it was a kind of Danish mixing zone, but we didn't quite have the yield to cyclists on turn thing. And, uh, but I do think uh, we're in a kind of rough and ready period and it's an emergency, so it's definitely like a worth thinking about. It does raise the conspicuity for cyclists in that near side position and the, and the the concept of a mixing zone, people, for people who uh, aren't me and Phil, I should explain, is that the uh, the turning conflicts managed on the approach to the junction, not when they get that green light. So if you're going ahead, and there's a motor car going left, they'll <coughs> cut across you on the approach. So you effectively mix, go over onto that right side, and then when the lights change, you know they're going left, you know you're going straight ahead in there. The, there are variations of it, and a lot of it we can do with like uh, line marking and paint in there. But I just just to finish off on on um, mixing zones, the reason I didn't put any in the LCDS was you just couldn't guarantee when cars were going to arrive and when they were going to mix across your path. And without letting people know that, if you if you had a cycle lane running straight through that merged over as a car was going through that, I wouldn't want the cyclist to feel they were in something. So then it was like, well, do you stop it, start it over there, and tried all different. Um, variations of it and perhaps it's worth picking them up but at the time we felt we can do better we can uh, we should be looking at more protected junction options uh but um i think phil's dead right um maybe uh, maybe i'll show some of those examples next week phil and we can have a bit of a discussion about it yeah i think uh, what we're really interested in, if you can actually use some i was just trying to find i'll have to dig it out maybe we can stop ideas but um the ones in uh new york had really clear giveaway markings, yield markings. Yeah. And um, uh, and I think if you actually turned the car lane, so, so you know, they didn't just flow on, you actually forced vehicles to come round and turn into the side, the shared lane. So yeah. you, 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 you eliminated the straight on movement, you used geometry to, you know, pop a violence to slow them down. Yeah, I think, yeah, because we got a little bit unstuck in that with the idea of a, we're having a very technical discussion here, everybody's enjoying this, the idea of a, of a floating give way so the cars have to give way before they turn across the, the cyclists in there. But uh, I think we could probably stretch it enough if you put a flexible post in on either end to, to have that and pretend it's a curb during these uh, temporary yeah. times in there. The yeah, advice we got from DFT when we're doing the local transport now is you can, you can, you can put a give way as, as long as it ends at a curb either side. So if you, if you have some kind of raised feature, you can run a give way. If a give way just stops in the middle of the carriageway, that's a problem. But if it runs yeah, but curbs can be very narrow these days. Exactly. Uh, like a, what is a curb if you're laying out temporary infrastructure? 
is a cone marking out a new curb or yeah it's definitely a uh, Phil and I will have that discussion on your behalf we need some drawings, we need some drawings. <laughs> sorry yeah that, that we're painting very difficult technical mental pictures uh, what, what I'll do next week uh, Graham is actually show you some examples of these things in there because um, it's mean for me to not put them in there I've got I've got about 20 of them and, and we'll maybe we'll do a mixing zone one and have it out properly uh, Chris did you want to ask a question yeah I had a question um, one of the challenges I think at the moment is to help uh, council leaders and transport leads understand just how far emergency funding can go and I sort of, I wanted to nail an answer, um, you know, the, from the maths I look at, you know, you could possibly be looking at, you know, I've heard councils who budget a million pounds for a low traffic neighbourhood, and now they look at it and go, actually, we probably could do that for between 20 and 30,000 pounds. And I think this point about, you know, actually pointing out to councillors, you know, 250 million pounds of emergency funding may be worth in normal money, at least 2.5 billion and potentially more. You know, I, I sort of was looking for some, I'd like some metric or some numbers from the esteemed group that you have on this call. You know, is a 10x effect, like a 10x um, effectiveness number about right? Is it higher for LTNs? Um, because I th I'm still hearing in, in the councils that are looking for excuses, money's still being used as, a, as an excuse. And I think we want to definitively bat this away. Uh, yeah, can I absolutely. say something? Can I say Thanks, something? Uh, those figures that came from Lambeth may be relevant because there's a list of all those things for their 1.8 million. And uh, that's before getting emergency funding. So maybe that will help as an example. And Rob, I can I can talk to a few of those. I've seen some of the breakdowns from Lambeth things. It's it's not it's still not as cheap as you think because of the costs of putting in traffic orders, and there's still some contractor time. So for quite simple ones, Lambeth are still looking at about fifteen twenty thousand per modal filter, even with temporary materials. But may, yeah, maybe that's being very conservative on it, and it will come down. But that does mean it's it's a hundred thousand pounds to do a, a low traffic neighbourhood, not. 300 to a million okay so someone just talked me through that because that sounds to me like you've got i mean in lambeth while they have an ambition to do some plans that they that, that weren't already planned I, I get the impression that a lot of what's in the first phase from claire holland's scheme was in the planning are we really why, why don't there's there's stuff i've seen that i can't share publicly so okay. why don't you contact me direct and we can probably talk through a few things okay yeah I'll just say on that, on the cost, when, you, when you're when at a local authority and you're costing out a full scheme, you're going to be putting in to, to redo the paving, to resurface the carriageway, to make sure your street lighting's all up to snuff in there. It's all part of the kind of scheme approach in there, and you'd be a, a foolish local authority not to ask for that from the funders to do something. But yeah, you can get a low traffic neighbourhood done with a few bollards and uh, dropping some concrete blocks around, and uh, it, it can be done for peanuts there's no doubt about it as as can like segregation of a i mean the the factor of 10 was was what we quoted the difference between light segregation and full segregation when we're putting that in, in camden in there i think those figures are still still relevant um so yeah if, you, if you're talking about putting a white line in and dropping cones it's it's peanuts really uh, we can do that on mass and uh, and i always like to quote um i met Met when I was at the International Transport Forum. I met the guy who did the first cycle track in um, in Amsterdam. It was like quite a spot, like a, a show due reverence in there. It's basically say they they laid it out in a few years. The whole Amsterdam network, uh, kind of like Seville style, and they've just been upgrading it since. I think this is our chance to lay out the network and see how it works, and then make the adjustments and and hardwire it in, rather than the way we have been doing it, which has been gold plated brick by gold plated brick. Uh, some might argue, some might not. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's my two pennies worth on that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, Brian, can I... Question um... about, sorry, can I just ask a question about um, the table, but... point Chris was making about um, leverage and about um, councils maybe looking for excuses or, or finding it difficult to get a plan going forward. Um, 
was there a comment about potential intervention from the DFT as, as I was arriving on the call or, or by TFL? Is there yeah. a real suggestion about that there might be such intervention? Yeah, Simon was making that point and I, and I have to admit I've been making that point several times as well. Um, particularly like if you've highlighted the core roots and, uh, and the, the big fear at the moment is we have a second peak and a, and a second lockdown and it's as a result of not changing the space now so people can't go in more actively. People can't get on buses, they can't get on trains and they all drive well then we're going to get horrific congestion, we're going to get terrible air quality. We already know that's linked with, uh, with um, the COVID and the exposure to it in there. So we're, we're really making a rod for our own backs. The government, I think, in the statement made it very clear uh, that they're, they do have legal powers to do something about it. So if someone's R number goes through the roof and they're not doing anything, there is the potential for the government to step in. But we'll have to see sorry, how the letter it goes. So sorry, Brian, which statement are you talking about? The statutory guidance? Yeah, yeah, the statement uh, that came out Sunday last. Yeah. So so it's really got reference in the Traffic Management Act and the rest of it. Yeah. I'm familiar it's with the still... guidance, but I'd be interested in what people have said about actually taking advantage of the potential to intervene there's, if, if there's been anything. There's been no, other than the power being in possible, I don't believe there's any comment in the public domain about it. And I, and I certainly don't think anyone should be banking on it happening. I think it's one of those threats that you carry. I, I do think what, one thing I have observed talking to quite a lot of transport leads is I'm still surprised how few have taken the five minutes to read the DFT guidance. And I still think that if you're having struggling with a council, if you can do nothing else, just ensuring that senior officers and the, the executive member have actually read that simple one or two pages from the DFT may be the most significant thing you can do. Yeah, okay. I'll just sit back and do nothing, absolutely. Uh, Kate, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, I, just, I was going to share an image. Um, can people see that, Julian Roadbath? Oh, no. Oh, have you done the shared screen? Thing. Yeah. I think Steve might need to enable it. There it is. That's right. Yeah, share screen's enabled, Brian. There you go. Hit the wrong button. Can, can you see that now? There you go. Yep. yep. Um, I, was, yeah, I was just going to flag this. 100% agree about the, the intuitive thing. If you if you put a thing that looks like a mini roundabout, people will drive around it. Julian Road Bars, Poynton, um, good examples of where it's been done. The cautionary tale that we need to take the communities with us. Julian Road Bath had. Uh, loads of accidents. I used to have this up next to my desk but with the, the before and after data not identified with the individual pictures and people who passed it who weren't highly engineers, they were petrochemical engineers, they didn't understand that lots of signs and markings and ugly 1980s stuff didn't mean safe which is what they thought it was and no signs and markings meant dangerous is what, just what they expected and I was on the TSRGD steering group when this was first being conceived, and DFT had the willies about it. I don't know if any great secret about that. Um, this worked, but after it was implemented, because the community didn't understand what had been done and why it was better, there was a campaign to have it removed, and there are now controlled features, and a, a zero casualty record has been replaced with an injury record at this location. So yes, definitely go for implied features, taking away overconfidence, but tell the community what you've done and why, or you might end up having to reverse it and against public benefit. Hmm. Absolutely. And uh, well, I just say we're in a kind of a temporary situation there anyway. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not being too frightened to actually try some things out, but you've still got to make sure that they work and they're, like the passing some kind of like a safety assessment and a, uh, uh, I'm sure Kate will help us out with all those. Um, could we, uh, Dave, did you want to come in with a question? Well, yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm going to ask some people. Um, we've In Glasgow, we've had an absolute rocket with the um, hire bikes. And in a number of places, Beryl has done it, Next Bike have done it, um, Circo have done it a little bit, um, getting agreement to make the bikes available free to key workers. Um, it's a good leverage point to get whoa, leverage point to get my, my phone sliding down. A uh, good leverage point to get city bikes uh, on the agenda for more cities, um, and whether some of this money that's going around can be used as leverage, because a lot of the schemes just need the leverage. Once they're up and running, 
they can actually uh, be self-funding. Um, so I'm wondering what sort of feedback have people got from where city bike schemes have been made available free to uh, key personnel? How has it taken off? I want to go and talk to Chrysia of Next Bike to see, what, see if she can give me some figures. Because most of Next Bike staff are furloughed at the moment. So, so we've had that in BCP. Um, we, we've, we've got the, the barrel bikes and we've had, uh, I think, over a thousand uh, people have taken up the offer um, from the NHS and, and local authorities, social care workers. Um, how many of them actually ridden, I'm not sure, but there's, you know, there, there's been a good take up of it, um, but we are a large scheme. It, do, it does make a point that these uh, schemes are very valuable as uh, resilient emergency, you know, civil emergency tr transport. Uh, the other one I've just been out surveying, um, I might get some pictures to Brian uh, to do some next, next session, is um, I built probably three submersible cycle routes. And I was revisiting one. Um, I, don't, I, I might be able to share it, but we can always circulate it afterwards. Um, 1995, I built a route to the, to the level of the 100-year flood, and then it went under the, in the uh, following year's 100-year flood. But it takes people underneath a busy main road, um, avoiding um, a very tricky climb up steps, pedestrian crossing, get across the main road job. Uh, and I've been going around looking at places where we can go under flood arches. Cheap and cheerful, but very quick ways to get past the blockages. And I don't know whether that fits in with some of this sort of, yeah. we, need to, we need to make the cycle routes flowing and simple. I really want to say all hands to the pump, but like it's, it's too cheesy, but <laughs> like a, all, all options are good in the storm. In I'm just going to bring um, Simon Monk in. I think he had his hand up. Uh, Graham, I'll come back to you in a second, if that's all right. Thanks. I was just going to jump back to the campaigning point, really. Um, and, and so I, I did the blog really about rattling sabres, you know, whether Gilligan and the DFT is willing to take over roads, whether TFL is... Um, and the mayor is, is, is kind of open to a lot of questions. Um, but the other angle that I was going to say, which we're using in London very strongly, is really simply, we can see the motor traffic volumes rising every day. You can see the numbers of cyclists now um, quite easily. It just takes a campaigner to stand by a road for half an hour in the peak, and you can very quickly get a daily count of how, as the motor traffic levels go up and the cycling levels collapse, where you're going to end up. So I think it's quite easy to call out authorities who are doing nothing to say, you have a very, very binary choice for you know any of your journeys that are over two kilometers, three kilometers, you're going to face a really, really serious situation very quickly, where either you, you know, because public transport's not going to be available for most people, either everyone's in their cars or everyone's on their bikes. It's that simple. So I think we're making that very binary case as another campaigning tool. Yeah, and more power to you for that. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Graham, Graham, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, it's just coming Hi, back. Can I make a quick point? Oh, yeah, Graham. I'll just let Graham come in first, and then uh, then Claire, then it's all yours, Graham. Going back to the uh, the technical stuff, um, junction treatments. One of the things that came up at our active travel forum from a member who's actually in this call. Um, right turns for cyclists. We can see that if it's a crossroads that's uh, signal controlled, then a Copenhagen two stage turn might be a way to do it in temporary infrastructure but what about where it's a signal controlled side road or a non-signal controlled side road and you want to make a right turn is are there any ideas for how we can deal with that yes yeah, so some of the things i put forward in that speech that we were starting to get funkier really with the towards the protected junction approach and the, and the two stage right it's uh some junctions you could do it anyway but like others you don't unless you're like a traffic signal engineer and you know the, the staging of all, I know a lot of cyclists that they're using junctions all the time will learn it anyway. And I know I can go now and I'm not going to get hooked in there. But you could be waiting on that near side to do that turn and another arm goes, a left slip goes out on the arm you're waiting for while you're looking on the far side for the, the head green. Again, terrible to explain that without, but Graham knows what I'm talking about. So so it's very difficult doing the, the two stages um and suggesting that without making some like pretty major modifications to the junction in there but like uh, some of the some of the kind of storage go across parallel with pedestrian options might well give us uh give us that advantage so um if there's any particular junctions you're looking at and you want us to have a think over uh, i'm happy to to help with that 
I will, I will let Claire come in now if that's all right because I think she was coming Hi, in next. me too. Some... Yeah, it was just um, two, just let Claire come first. two points picking up on, on Chris Kenyon's point about you know how, how cheap this stuff is. So the first one is, I don't know if anyone saw, there's a thread from Sheffield today, which is basically, um, you know, in, in Manchester, for instance, all the councils have been given 500 grand from TFGM for low cost measures. A lot of councils don't even have that. And what we're worried about in particularly Manchester borough is that that money has basically been spent on some pretty high end barriers in the center of town and there's no money left for anywhere else. And this is combined with the fact that um, councils have obviously through COVID introduced pretty executive powers. So some of these decisions are being made by one person, the leader of the council or whatever, which is fine if, you know, in some ways we've needed that in a crisis. But so I think we've got a problem. You're right, Chris, in that there are already councils who aren't getting this. I, I, I haven't got proof of this yet, but I'm pretty sure that Manchester spent all its money in the city centre and there's no money left for outside. Um, and then the second point is that what we're seeing in Manchester is uh, that but um, space for pavements is taking away from bike lanes. And that might be a topic for next week, Brian, but what, what um, this is a campaigning point, but also what could be done? It feels like it's just potentially ignorance. Like surely there's some signs that could be put up that say, you know, motorists don't overtake or something, but basically there's key places like Oxford Road is a showpiece cycle route in Manchester and the bike lanes being taken away. Um, so what what other proactive things we can propose to councils that feel they need to do that uh, to not make, you know, out the frying pan into the fire? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and that was always a, a little bit of a fear in there. Well, well, one of those things like you want people to do stuff instantly. And so when councils go, right, go out, make some space in there. And someone comes like, oh, look, if I take this cycle lane, that's great. The cars will still be able to move through there. So job well done. And I've widened this footway in there. I, I like to feel it's just like a basic non-thinking like that. And, uh, but certainly we have noticed on, on my end, which is basically like supporting Chris Boardman stuff, and we are raising these issues. And then we're trying to make people think about some like dedicated corridors in there. So I'm hoping there will be news on that soon. <laughs> And, uh, and also I'll say for the rest of the country, um, uh, I kind of spoke about it before we started, but I've been doing lots of work with uh, with the brilliant Dr. Robin Lovelace, one of my heroes over at the Institute of Transport in there. And the kind of the brains, uh, I'm sure Rachel Aldridge will forgive me, but the brains behind a defensive cycle tool. And uh, he's going to come on next week and tell us uh, and tell us quite a lot about what we've been doing. Um, so uh, spoilers, we're, we're on it. Um, can I, can I oh, oh, sorry, go on. I'll, I'll let actually I'll let Megan come in because Bob's already spoke. Bob, hang on a second. We'll just let Megan have a go. Um, just in terms of speed, I've had a local authority ask me if there's a quicker way to do modal filters. Um, anybody know the the quickest option that's actually been used by a local authority to to get things put in place legally? Well, I mean, yeah, Mark Strong was on the other week talking about the Madeira Drive one. They did action that quite quickly. Um, like, uh, there's been a lot of misconceptions about traffic orders and you have to wait and this, that and the other in the consultation. Like, uh, we're in an emergency, block it. Um, my, my boss, uh, John Dales, was talking on an urban design thing uh, uh, last week and he was saying, look, there's a gas leak. Don't think about the process. Sort out the gas leak. That's the kind of uh, approach that we're trying to get local authorities to make. So if there's a real need to put that filter in there, put it in. You enact the order. You can do it instantly. So people, once they start taking it seriously, we do have the legal mechanisms to just make it happen. I think that that's certainly the council officer's position. It's just getting everybody else, like in, in the legal team, signed up. Sure, when lots of people are set up to, to tell people why they can't do it to manage like expectations and stuff, but we're, we've got to like get ourselves out of that mode of thinking now. To like, what are we doing? We've got an emergency. Let's uh, do as much as we can because uh, we'll be judged very harshly if we didn't do this stuff in a in a few months' time. Um, Bob, did you want to come in? I'm finally going to let you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Just uh, again on the campaigning front. Um, 
you know, picking up what Simon and, and Simon Monk and Chris Canyon were saying, um, you know, good points about how stuff can be cheap and we need to get across to you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so uh, what they were saying was, yeah, get those messages across. But, but what I was thinking of is how do you deal with it when you say, yeah, we want to have these filters or uh, extended footways or whatever, and we're going to take away road space from cars. The government has told us to do this. What do you do when the uh, councillor says, oh, yeah, but we've already got a lot of cars, we've already got congestion. If we do this, we will get more congestion. Now, I can say, look, I just want to have less space for cars. But how do we deal with that kind of argument that, um, you, know, uh, you know, how do we do it if we don't know if there is going to be pressure from above? How do we actually engage on a campaigning front? And I'd, I'd just like to hear from what uh, campaigners feel. Yeah, you can say it's cheap. You can say Lambeth is doing it. Uh, you can say uh, people want it. You can say you've been told to do it by the government. But you know, how do we get around that last thing of the fact that you are taking road space away from motor vehicles? Uh, yeah, go on, Chris. I, I've, I've got plenty to say as well, but yeah, a lot of the people do it. Uh, look, I mean, the imperative to act, um, I think this is a little bit like the failure to act in January on PPE. I think that's a very powerful moral imperative for most councillors. I would encourage everybody on the call to stop using the cars per household metric and just do it car per resident. We need to blow apart this metric of cars per household is a massively misleading metric. And it, even when we're campaigning, we pick up on the argument the car industry has backed for years. Um, and then competition. I think half of local politics is competition with your local borough or with other city councils. And I just think relentlessly comparing what's happening in neighbouring boroughs or cities to your own city um, for at least half of the politicians out there is a significant one. I mean, in London, Kensington and Chelsea and Wandsworth, the two most car-centric boroughs in the city, have launched emergency action plans that really shines a very harsh light on a number of other councils that haven't. I think I was going to jump in as well and just say, to my mind, this is all about political will at its root. Council officers and councillors are so used to finding 500 reasons not to do things. Um, you have to kind of cut through that and no amount of evidence, data and well argument, reason, you know, well argued reasoning kind of works. At the end of the day, it's what do the council leaders, what do the key councillors care about? Do they care about not being re-elected? Do they care about prizes and shiny baubles? Do they care about funding? Do they care about being voted out? Do they, you know, what do they ultimately care about? Do they care about PR, good or bad, etc.? You have to find what works for each councillor, each council, and you have to then ruthlessly exploit it, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I'm not an infrastructure campaigner, I'm a political will campaigner, and that's what every single campaigner on this call should be, ultimately, because that's what gets you through. That's what gets you past the point of saying, we haven't got the money or we haven't got the funding yet or we need to do a bid or we need to do a, a traffic order we need to do this or there's 50 other reasons why we can't do this right now it's a crisis you either act right now or you face what comes later um in a crisis and so the point is to make that point politically and make it land i'm gonna i'm gonna egg this a little bit sorry uh, just two other things um those letters from hospitals are dynamite like they are political dynamite. They literally explicitly say, we'd like to see protected bike lanes and low traffic neighborhoods. So if you can get, if you have a health worker in your campaign area or in your city, um, if you can get them to get a CEO of a health, of a trust to write that letter, um, I, can't even, I can't encourage it enough. And then secondly, certainly cycling works. Um, we need to get employers in every single city now doing it. And you're doing two things. You're putting pressure on those who don't want to do it, but you're also giving air cover to councillors who do. Megan, did you want to come in? I saw you had your hand up there. Did you want to write a reply and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, but then I got 
I started looking at Croydon modal filters and I've completely lost my train of thought. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> That's Sorry. all right. Um, yeah, what, what I was going to say, I don't know if anybody saw like the Sunday Times article uh, on Sunday, um, basically like about the Transport Heroes thing and it had Chris Boardman talking about it, but it, it was basically if people don't ride and it, <laughs> when the cars come back, what's going to happen? Uh, just in terms of transport planning, the sheer efficiency of, uh, of moving vast amounts of people who can't get the bus or the tram or the train. Um, if we shift them on bikes, all we're done. If they all get in cars, the, the Sunday Times was quoting 400 mile long queues to get in there. We're just not going to get anything. The economy is going to collapse in there. The government might have to come in. We'll get another, another peak, second like um, lockdown. It's, it's going to be horrific unless we do stuff in there. So... So we can be nice to an extent, but really the, the time for niceness is ending with that there's no real logical way of getting people into work if they can't use public transport in an efficient way. If everybody that's got a car uses it, most of our cities are going to come grinding to a halt straight away. So uh, there's that. Other examples, I think one of the other things I've really learned from local authorities is often they're risk averse, which you know makes a lot of sense. They have an awful lot of stuff to cover in their remit. So examples of other people who've done it, um, so all the photos of, that are being shown, all the process information that we can share about how other people are doing it, I think is really powerful. Um, one of the ones I often point to is Lester, who closed a lane for about, I think, six to eight weeks in order to look at um, how much that affected congestion. Um, they didn't do anything. They just closed it, monitored it. Turns out it didn't. So then that gave them what they needed to do in order to make it permanent. I then use that all the time with local authorities to be like, you know, look, it's not necessarily going to ruin things. Lester did it. You can do it too. It's okay. So yeah, I Lester one, the Lester oh. one was amazing. They took a lane out there in a ring road. Imagine London doing that, people. Imagine Manchester doing that. 